am so excited to be able to welcome you all to the first in-person Naturalist Journeys Lecture Series since March 2020. <laughs> but thanks to your support and the support of many, many members and donors and our um, sponsors, we have, as probably most of you know, kept this series alive and humming online. And it's already been happening this season and it's happened over the last couple of seasons in a modified format. And it's just super exciting to be able to open this room up to this use again tonight. So let's see, I wanted to let you know that this year's Naturalist Journey series is presented our sponsors of this series this year are Capital Copy, Union Mutual, Northfield Savings Bank, Concept 2, the Edwards Jones Office of Keith LaCroix, Washington Electric Co-op, and Onion River Outdoors. And so as a nonprofit organization, or a for good organization, as I like to say, North Branch depends on community support like this. So please join me in thanking these sponsors with a round of applause and by supporting them with your business. <laughs> I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Emily Seifert. I'm the Deputy Director here at North Branch. And while we are sharing gratitude, I want to highlight a recent grant from the Vermont Arts Council, which is allowing us to make a whole host of access and technology improvements here at North Branch across our facilities and programming, including three improvements that are at work tonight. One is we now have hearing assistance devices available. You may have seen them as you came in. If you didn't and you want them, Scoot on back, Emily will help you. Right, so great. <laughs> Another is we are now able to broadcast this live to folks at home watching on our YouTube channel. Welcome folks on YouTube. And we are also, as we have been recording tonight's talk um, with new cameras and technology, and so as usual the last couple of years, this will be archived on our website and available for you to you know, send us a link to your friend in Idaho or wherever who wants to join us on tonight's journey. So before I introduce Sean Beckett, I want to invite all of you also to enjoy the gallery show. I saw some of you checking it out already, which features Ed Epstein's incredibly detailed charcoal drawings on this side of the room, and Philip Robertson's gorgeous relief prints on the other side, and there's a few out in the Rock Creek room as well to enjoy. Uh, these pieces are all available for purchase, unless they have a little red sticker on them already, um, and a portion of the proceeds do benefit North Branch. And these will be up through Friday, February 24th. So you have a couple more weeks to enjoy them and send your friends over to enjoy them as well. So for many of you, Sean needs no introduction as he's been here on staff since 2017. And in fact, he's been a member of the North Branch community since um, he was a teenager. He went on a North Branch birding trip to Costa Rica where he was bitten by the nature bug, um, and probably lots of other bugs, I imagine. <laughs> um, he, studied, he went on to study biology and environmental studies at Vassar College, and he received his master's degree from the UVM Field Naturalist and Ecological Planning Program. Uh, before, before joining us here at North Branch, he researched several different species of birds, including two of my favorites, the Atlantic puffins and sawwet owls, and Clark's nutcrackers, and many other incredible research that he's done. Um, he's taught wildlife photography and led wildlife safaris across North America. And then since North Branch joining us here, he's led about a dozen national and international trips for us while also managing our suite of program for, programs for adults, ranging from evening programs like this one all the way up to our Biodiversity University and Educator Institute series. So, Sean um, wears many hats and I'm really excited to uh, introduce him all to you all tonight. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for the introduction. Emily, I'm like blushing. <laughs> um, so let me just get some technology going in outer space here for a second. Outer space? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be here all night. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so as, as Emily mentioned, I started out um, catching the nature bug uh, by going on a North Branch trip to uh, Costa Rica and Ecuador um, back a while ago. I'll explain more about that in just a moment, actually. Um, but 
Uh, tonight, my, my goal is, so this is the first naturalist journey we've done back in person in quite some time. And we thought we'd go back to the original spirit of naturalist journeys, which is like, just let's just go traveling together. Um, tonight is not about like heady research necessarily, although that's great too. Um, it's about like, let's look at some beautiful photographs of amazing wildlife and go to a bunch of different places all around the world and talk about everything from photography tips to uh, nature nuggets to travel stories to misadventures in travel stories. Um, so yeah, point is just to mostly have fun. And um, I think pretty much all the photographs, except for this one, um, in the talk tonight are taken during North Branch Nature Center um, programs. Um, so let that be known. And uh, you know, I, I would be remiss to, to um, fail to mention that you know, if you would like to come on a trip like this, I can hook uh, you up. Um, so consider joining us on one of these adventures afar at some point. So um, with that, Em, would you hit the lights, please? I bring you to uh, a time in the past when Sean was much younger. Um, <laughs> and this is actually in Ecuador. Um, and uh, we were, I had the opportunity to go with North Branch Nature Center on two trips back to back. And in my mind, they kind of both blended together because I was young and hormonal and everything. I can't really remember <laughs> the, the particulars of which thing happened in the rainforest in Ecuador versus Costa Rica. But I remember uh, this year in Ecuador, and I don't remember what year it was, but I do remember that um, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince had just come out, which was indispensable um, in the packing list uh, for the trip. And, and, um, uh, and so I... Uh, so this is the ragtag bunch of other teenagers that were out there with me. Um, under the uh, leadership of uh, Jean Fasani here on, on the left, um, an amazing advocate and birder and love nothing more than connecting young people with the natural world and really um, delivered me into the light of birding and natural history and all of that. Um, anybody know and remember Jean Fasani? Well, I see a few hands. Wonderful. Anybody know Adam French, who I believe is a Spanish teacher at U32 still? Yes. Okay, great. And over on the right, you should, I don't think you should know him. This, uh, this is Rudy Gels. He's our in-country guide in Ecuador back then. And what's actually really appropriate is right now, at this moment, this guy, uh, Jim Armstead, <laughs> is in Ecuador right now leading a North Branch trip with Rudy Gellis oh, as the in-country guide, you know, 12, 15 years later. Um, so I love that these relationships that we've developed have been maintained for, for decades. Um, and um, this was my first real adventure into photography, um, really taking it seriously. But this was also before digital cameras had really um, come out in any, any way that made them useful on, in wildlife or landscape photography. So my first attempts at photography were actually using slide film, film cameras. It's way easier to learn photography on a film camera than it is on a digital camera with a gazillion different buttons. It's the same exact physics, um, but with way more buttons involved. So um, this, is with, uh, this is with Velvia 100 uh, slide film photographing Otavalo. And these trips were um, you know, really formative for the first time leaving the country and seeing amazing things like blue for movies. Um, I know. But, Feet so blue that it reflects up under your stomach, right? Uh, and so the male on the left and the, and the female on the right. We didn't go to the Galapagos, but there's seabird breeding islands just off the coast of Ecuador. And um, just off the coast of Ecuador is also where humpback whales uh, migrate north um, into warmer waters to breed. And they use the corridor between mainland Ecuador and this island, Isla de la Plata, um, to travel. And it's breeding season, which means um, they're doing some pretty oh, wow. things. So on the list of things that we saw that weren't on the itinerary, this might top it all. Um, we weren't expecting to see whales, but having them breach and, and explode out of the water right next to the boat enough to, to make the boat tremble uh, was pretty life-changing. Wow. That and things like going to Sani Lodge, which is a three-hour motorboat ride down a tributary of the Amazon, and then a two-hour canoe ride through mangroves to get into this little lagoon, an off-grid place where there's um, you know, macaws and trogans and parrots and just hundreds of bird species. Um, the bugs were so loud, it sounded like a fighter jet outside of your, your, uh, you know, your window when you woke up in the morning. And this is also where I had the chance to try photographing birds for the first time. And I probably photographed 100, 200, 300 different birds, and this is the only photo that came out. This slide. <laughs> but it's a good one, this crowned woodnip on the right. Beautiful hummingbirds. There's, you know, there's almost as many hummingbird species in, uh, in Costa Rica and Ecuador. 
um, than there are bird species that you can find in Vermont, period, at this time of, <laughs> this time of year. And here on the left, these are Hawatsin, um, just a crazy kind of archaic bird that is uh, from a pretty basal lineage in the evolution of birds. Their chicks actually still have thumbs uh, or little claws on, on the wrists so that they can climb up vegetation um, since they live these birds kind of live over mangroves in kind of really wet areas. It behooves the chicks to be able to climb out of the water. Um, so these awesome Hawatsons. So all of that led me to, uh, so all, that, that got me hooked on, on wildlife travel and you know, it made me feel deep in my bones that um, connecting people with these wild places and wild um, animals and, and, um, and settings is deeply powerful and profound and really can change people's lives. It changed mine. Um, and so then, fast forward, I found myself as a wildlife guide in Yellowstone. So we're going to go to four places tonight. We're going to go to Yellowstone, we're going to go to Panama, and we're going to go to uh, the desert southwest, and we're going to go to South Africa. And all four of these places are North Branch Nature Tender trips that have happened since 2020. <laughs> Amazingly, we squeaked in Panama and Yellowstone before March of 2020. <laughs> um, and then uh, the canyons and South Africa we did this past year. So here we are in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone, and I'm serving cinnamon buns, but everyone else is looking at wolves through a spotting scope on the other side. <laughs> so Yellowstone. Here we are, um, in, in, we're looking at Wyoming here. We have Colorado to uh, the south, Montana to the north, Idaho to the west. And this part up here in the northwest corner is what we call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. It's this kind of big chunk here. And it's this 18 million acre expanse that is made up of national parks and national forests that together comprise about 18 million acres of space. It's the largest contiguous um, ecosystem in the lower 48. You have to go to Alaska to find anything bigger than that that's contiguous. Vermont is 6 million acres, so it's a huge uh, place. And not only is it a huge area geographically, but they, uh, you know, they say that the, the creator painted with with broader brush strokes out there. I like, I like the way of thinking the landscape um, like that, where the mountains are tall, the valleys are wider, the trees are bigger, the animals are bigger. Everything is like, you know, like, like here, but stretched out and expanded. So we go to these big vantage points like this, looking out over huge expanses of space. Um, and through places like this, you know, Yellowstone is not a place where a lot of species will come right up next to you. Sometimes they do, as we'll see. But the beauty of Yellowstone is you go to a spot like this, you set up shop with spotting scopes, and you just look out at the world. And off of the distance, you can see elk passing by, and bison, and coyotes hunting, and foxes moving around, and if you're lucky, wolves, and bears, and eagles, and everything like that. And so it's a place where you can kind of sit down and take your seats in the audience, as it were, and just look out at whatever um, you know, crops up that day. You never know what you're going to see, but it's always amazing. My favorite thing about Yellowstone, I say that a lot, but I think this is really my favorite thing about Yellowstone is that around every corner there's a thing that is so beautiful that if you took that thing and you moved to the east coast and you drew a you know, border around it, it would unto itself be its own national park. And yet out in Yellowstone, these things are so commonplace that it's all just wrapped up into one thing. So like this is a part of the Yellowstone River that doesn't have a name. This overlook is not named. This is about a quarter mile hike from a little picnic area. And it's absolutely stunning. So here we have um, Patricia and Jane um, surveying the scene. And of course, around the next corner are things like the hot springs of uh, Mammoth Hot Springs. This is a limestone, uh, the, the bedrock geology here. Did anyone have my bedrock geology talk a couple months ago? Okay, different, different but similar story. Um, uh, limestone geology um, with a super volcano just a couple miles underground. And as groundwater from the 40 plus feet of snow that fall in this region each year, as the groundwater trickles down through the cracks in the earth, that groundwater heats up. And as it gets closer and closer and farther and farther down, that water heats up to 300 or 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. And that heat and pressure forces it back up to the surface. And that heat and the pressure kind of dissolves the surrounding limestone into that water. So by the time the lime, the, that limestone filled, that calcium filled water reaches the surface, it's just chock full of, um, of that limestone sediment. And so it hits the surface, the water evaporates away in the dry air, and it leaves behind these deposits the tune of this, um, this feature here, Mammoth Hot Springs, gains about 2,000 pounds of limestone every day. Oh. Oh. Other places in the park that have different types of geology or like around Old Faithful and that sort of thing, those features form very slowly. It might take 100 years for an inch of crust to form around 
the guys are going to hold faithful, say. But here's an intrepid bunch of travelers. <laughs> now, we're just outside of the park here. The wildlife doesn't know boundaries, and so we don't obey them either. And uh, we're just outside of the, the park here, uh, behind the camera, we were looking at these. Oh. These bighorn sheep that had come down to forage in the, in the uh, lush green grass down at the valley floor. And at night, they climb their way back up. <clears throat> yeah, they climb their way back up into this kind of stuff to spend the night. But in the daytime, they come down to the valley floor. And they, the, these, these males here are just kind of messing around. They're sparring. Um, but everyone else is uh, shedding their winter fur, <clears throat> which is a process unto itself, and eating this great green grass. But they also really like these roads because these bighorn sheep and mountain goats and things like that that live in these really austere environments, they're great at extracting minerals from uh, rocks and just surroundings. So you'll see them just standing next to a cliff licking, licking the cliff <laughs> to get magnesium or you know, whatever other trace elements it might need in its diet. But a road, a dirt road, fills that uh, niche as well, especially if those roads are salted. <clears throat> now, if you drive around those roads a lot and your car is covered in that, then your car becomes a salt. <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny. And so we call this the Jackson Hole Car Wash. <laughs> and it's really fun to have something like this licking the side of your car. <laughs> um, but, um, but sheep are very susceptible to disease, and she, the sheep uh, tend to keep to their own populations, and there's not a lot of movement between populations. And so if you're a car moving between sheep populations, you can transmit diseases from one to the other if you are a salt lick, a mobile salt lick. And so... Um, so we only let one sheep lick the car, and that was the last sheep that they let lick the car. <laughs> so this is what we do on our North Branch Nature Center Adventures of Fire. We look at stuff and point at things. So sometimes we point at rivers and trees, and other times we stand in the field and we point at things slightly farther in the distance. And sometimes we stand in a line and look in the other direction of the really cool thing. This is Grand Prismatic Hot Spring. It's a uh, spring the size of a football field um, with boiling water. And all the colors you see back there are different um, types of uh, thermophile bacteria that are living at 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Each temperature range gets its own uh, kind of band of different suite of, of organisms that turns it those colors. <clears throat> and you can see this, is, this trip was over Memorial Day weekend. And look at our attire that day, right? <clears throat> Sometimes we stand up on the left in a line and we look towards the right. And these are the Grand Teton, uh, the Teton Range, with Grand Teton being the tallest mountain in there. We're looking down into the river bottom of the Snake River. Sometimes we sit around and look at things. <laughs> uh, here we are back in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone. And what we're actually looking at down here in the green grass is this. Oh, it gets better. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so these are Cubs of the Year, Koi's. Um, this is, this is uh, maybe the first day of June or the last day of May, something like that. <clears throat> These cubs were born in hibernation um, probably around March or so, just a few months before. So this is the first couple of weeks that these cubs are out, and the first time these cubs have been out in an environment where there's food everywhere. <clears throat> so mom is searching for, uh, she's eating green grass, she's eating ants out of the fallen logs, and her diet's going to change every couple of days throughout the whole year going from grass to tubers to ants to fish to elk calves to, you know, you name it. It used to be that one of those things in that list would be uh, garbage dumps in Yellowstone or the handouts from the windows. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore, fortunately. <laughs> I'm trying to build this, uh, this like, calendar of wildlife near signs, and, and we're doing pretty well. So we have don't approach the wildlife. Some signs, you need your own interpretation of what the sign actually means. This is, I don't, you know, whatever studies, this is the speed bumps on the moose, I don't know. Make sure you yield to the bison in the crosswalk. And then on our last Yellowstone trip, my favorite is, uh, you know, the rangers that just walk around and put these signs next to the elk. Hire <laughs> interns to just chase the elk around, moving the signs all day. But despite... Um, all the signage and the encouragement at the gate to not approach the wildlife, <clears throat> one of the other favorite things to photograph is people photographing wildlife way too close. 
So here we have a 2,000 pound bison, the same size as the sedan next to it, that is about five feet away from these people taking their, their picture. Um, and you know, you go down the road another 100 yards and you see this 2,000 pound bison foraging next to these people who don't have an escape vehicle to jump into. Um, so I think the most unpredictable wildlife species in Yellowstone is humans. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of doing this, we do this, um, which is we are in the safety uh, well, sometimes it is safe to be close to wildlife, but in the cases where it's not, we can be in these vehicles that have um, these kind of like escape hatches, these roof hatches. You can pop out the top, photograph from the from the vehicle or out the window. And that allows us to get photographs like this oh, wow. without having to stand that close oh, to the animal. Um, so this is actually during the fall. This is elk uh, bugling directly <coughs> at us. <laughs> Um, this is Mammoth Hot Springs. It's the last place in the entire 18 million acre ecosystem where there's still fresh green grass because they actually water the lawns of the officers' quarters in the Park Service housing. And the biggest bull elk come and they stake their claim to their little suburban lot and they collect a harem of females on that. And that also happens to be the head, one of the biggest headquarters of the park. So there's millions of people moving through this landscape. And of course, that leads to interesting Hi, Jinx. Oh. One of my favorite things about, I already said Yellowstone, one of my favorite things about North Branch Nature Center trips, <coughs> compared to all the other companies I've guided for and worked for, is we can spend just as much time looking at, um, you know, mayfly nymphs under a rock in a river in Yellowstone <laughs> as we do looking at the bison. So I thought it was appropriate to have a bison back here out of focus, but we're really paying attention to these beautiful mountain bluebirds. Oh. And our, our last, 20, our 2020 trip, happened from March 7th to March 12th. How's that for getting under the wire? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I specifically picked those dates because March 7th to March 8th is when mountain bluebirds arrive in the northern range of Yellowstone every year. They're, they're one of the first migrants to come back. So because we're focusing on uh, little things a lot, of course we see a lot of really cool behaviors and interactions that might be overlooked by the people that show up only caring about bears or whatever it may be. So that allowed us to go searching for, we were out looking for ducks, um, and we came across this beaver having some corn in the cob willow here. Watch this. Yeah. A little scratch, and then off to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and this is why we have to plant hundreds of saplings over here at the edge of the river right here. <laughs> but this actually gets better because this beaver wasn't alone. Oh, wow. oh my. There was a group of trumpeter swans wondering what this beaver was up to here at the water's edge. Yeah. And this one wanted to steal the branch away from the beaver. <laughs> the beaver grabs it back. <laughs> So because we're out here looking for um, whatever the ecosystem wants to offer up to us, we see really cool things. Getting out extremely early, early in the morning, coming across a mother bison, watching her give birth um, right in front of us, watching the calf stand up for the first time. This calf is about 20 minutes old. Wow. And then being able to watch that calf over the course of the week, learning to nurse and walk around and feed and, and kind of come into its own. See how this calf is orange and the grass is green behind it? Um, so this seems really maladaptive to have a really tasty, slow animal being a color that stands out against this background. You want to blend in to your surroundings, right? Well, the major predator of bison calves and elk calves and moose calves and deer calves or deer fawns, right? All of which are the same color um, are things like wolves and coyotes and they're partially colorblind. And so if anyone in here is red, green, colorblind, you might be able to attest to the fact that this doesn't stand out against this grass all that well at all. Um, so what might look like to us a um, very clear, obvious difference actually is a great adaptation against its key predators. Then we stay up late at night, watching the sunset, um, looking out over the Madison Mountain Range, way up in the northern end of the ecosystem. This is down at the southern end of the ecosystem, looking out at the southern end of the Teton Range. If anyone's been to Jackson Hole Mountain Resort to go skiing, that's the tram tower up on top of there. Um, 
It's not beautiful landscape. And uh, this is my favorite photograph I've ever taken. And I have to admit, this one was not on the North Branch Nature Center trip, but it's a good story nonetheless. Um, this is like my little PSA about art, uh, photography, outdoor photography as a form of artwork. And I love photography because all of the adventure becomes part of the artwork. And I think that um, photography often gets a bad rap or like a, is treated as like a second class art form because like it's way easier to press a button on a camera than to like create a big oil painting. Um, and I'm good at pressing the button on a camera and I'm really bad with a paintbrush. Um, but um, as a photographer, or as, as you know, an oil painter, like no shade to any artist of any, 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 of any type, um, but you know, one can, from the comfort of their studio, paint a sunset you know, uh, rendition of a scene like this in winter in February, right? But to get this photograph as a photograph, you have to be there um, at that exact time. And so in this case, we had been rained on by the storm for four straight days, um, seeing very little, um, ruining camera gear, taking no photographs, and four days later, drenched, we decided, what the heck, let's just go for a walk in this thunderstorm around the geyser basin, because we're out of other things to do. This was not a North Branch trip, so we didn't have those lightning protocols uh, in place. <laughs> um, so we're walking around, and then the thunderstorm finally passes us, and the sunset reflects on the back of the thundercloud, reflecting that light into the geyser, into the uh, waters of Anemone Geyser in the foreground. And that's the scheme of Old Faithful in the back right here. Um, so patience uh, really pays off. And you know, you might be out there for eight days and walk away with one photograph, but that's all you need. Lower Falls of the Yellowstone, 300 foot waterfall. Here around the next corner, there's this. Wow. Um, all of the wildlife is really adapted for surviving the winter. Really, anything can survive in June in Yellowstone. It's easy. Like there's food everywhere. It's a nice temperature. It's beautiful. Like it's like all of I think the um, like the uh, like American frontier settlers that went out there and settled must have done it in June because that is the only month where you would think that was a good idea. <laughs> then December rolls around and like this is what's happening, and a bison is having to walk knee deep in a river because there's five feet of snow on either side, and that's the only way to get from point A to point B, is to be covered in frost. And Speaking of covered in frost, remember, this is Memorial Day that we started this trip, and this is the Denver International Airport. So we had flown from Burlington to, uh, you know, to Denver, and we were waiting to catch our uh, flight to Jackson Hole from Denver. Half the group was already in Jackson, and I was with the other half um, that was traveling you know, the following day. And we get to Denver, and our flight's delayed because it looks like this outside. We finally get on our plane about two hours late, at like you know, 11.30 at night. We get out, we get de-iced by the de-icer after waiting a very long line for de-icing, and we get lined up uh, in line to take off. We wait in line so long that we have to go back and get in the line for the de-icer, and we get de-iced again, and then we get back in line to take off. And we wait so long in that line that we go back to the de-icer, and the de-icer runs out of de-icing fluid for the entire airport. So they shut down the airport, and here we are in a blizzard nine hours away from Denver, uh, when half the group is already in Jackson Hole. So um, we call up our fixer in Jackson, telling her what's up, and she says, okay, I just rented you the last SUV in Denver like at the uh, rental car places that exist. Run over there right now and get it. And by the time you get in the car and start driving towards Denver, I will start calling all the hotels uh, with decreasing, like increasing distance from Denver until I find one, because the whole airport shut down, right? Until I find one that has availability. So we get in this, this SUV and we're just driving through a blizzard and we get a call from Jameson saying, okay, get off at exit 412. Oh, there. So we pull in, we sleep for two hours, we wake up. I mean, like we weren't really asleep anyway. We we started the nine hour drive through the blizzard that was still ongoing to get to Jackson. We arrive at the visitor center in uh, Grand Teton where Jameson has been taking the other guests around a beautiful day in the park. <laughs> <laughs> and we swap places and we hop in the, the vehicle together and then our trip begins. So not the most relaxed start to an adventure, but definitely the most memorable. Now let's go to Panama. Ah, oh, very different, much warmer. Um, 
you know, beautiful, amazing tropical landscapes. This is uh, down in Central America, right? This is the last um, country in the line of kind of the Isthmus countries um, that Central America um, section. So we have Colombia to the west, Costa Rica to the east. And, you know, Panama is only 40 miles wide at its narrowest point. And so from the tops of mountains, like this is the Volcan Baru, you can actually look to one side and see the Atlantic and look to the other side and see the Pacific. Mm. Panama is, I think, the only country where you can stand at one spot and watch the sunrise over the Atlantic and set over the Pacific in the same wow. place. It's pretty cool. Just like in the where you put up a spot and you look 40 miles out in the distance, um, it's really hard to find stuff in this. Um, and birding in the tropics takes some practice and some work. And it takes really good um, local birding guides. So we always, in all of our destinations um, out of country, we work with um, guides who live there, whose livelihood is based on ecotourism there, so we can support their business and their livelihood. And also, they're way better at being able to find stuff in places like this. Fortunately, photography has gotten way easier in conditions like the rainforest because you can basically shoot, I mean, you can shoot a crystal clear photograph these days, like in this room with the lights off, um, because of how good low light sensitivity is a lot of digital cameras. So that makes us uh, able to capture photographs that would have been impossible when you were trying to use slide film back in 2007 or whatever, um, like I was, 2004. So this, you know, toucan was sitting in the shade, you know, a ways away, um, but comes out perfectly. Keel build toucan here. And a closer relative of this, so this toucan was just hanging out in, in the rainforest, these are a relative of the toucan called the fiery billed arasari. And here they come to, uh, often they come to feeders. And there, and there, you don't put bird seed in your feeder, you put bananas and other fruits and things like that in your feeders. And, um, and all sorts of frugivorous, fr frugivore, frugivorous birds, fruit eating birds, will come and eat the, eat the bananas and whatever, like these. So I love this shot. This, this photograph is really all about the background. And a quick photo tip for those that are into this sort of thing is pay as much attention to the background as the foreground. Um, I actually moved to a really uncomfortable place to be able to put this red thing behind this bird. Um, everything else was, was yellow and, and green behind this bird in every direction. But by, by moving over to a spot where I could get this red behind the bird, you could have a composition where the bill of the bird on the right kind of join in, in the foreground joins with what's going on in the background. It kind of makes the whole thing come together. Wow. Birds here in North America are spectacular. Birds down there are spectacular in other ways that are different and worth seeing. Um, the color, the diversity is absolutely astonishing. There's like 150 different kinds of tanagers. Here we have the uh, scarlet tanager. If we're really lucky, a summer tanager might show up. Well, summer tanagers are all over the place down there. Um, but just amazing diversity of birds. Let's see, we got Phylicious trogon, Crescidora pendula, crimson back tanager, golden hooded tanager, red legged honey honeycreeper. Leave it to 19th century like white naturalists yeah. to name birds after the least interesting part about them. <laughs> <laughs> little red, tiny little red flag at the bottom of this striking blue bird. <laughs> Summer tanager, uh, wood creeper of some some sort, <clears throat> lessons mot mot. These great little tail doodads that, makes, that, that are characteristic of mot mots. Mot mot, what a great name. Red headed barbets. This is a scintillant hummingbird in its nest that it was still building. It has a little tuft of, uh, of um, like stamen from a flower, I think, that it's using to build into its nest. Rufus tailed hummingbird. A uh, euphonia that looks like five different kinds of euphonias. Uh, and a zone tailed hawk. Now, wouldn't you think that was a turkey vulture if you saw it way up cattling with turkey vultures? Yeah. This is some. This bird isn't here, but it's in South America. But I also learned in our South Africa trip recently that, uh, which and they were there too, um, that zone-tailed hawks have actually evolved to look like turkey vultures from the bottom, and they they kettle with turkey vultures. Because if you are a prey species that gets eaten by hawks, you know that turkey vultures are fine. So you'll see turkey vultures. They can, so they can identify turkey vultures from problematic raptors, right? Turkey vultures that are scavengers. So they see a kettle of turkey vultures and they think nothing of it. And so zone-tailed hawks camouflage themselves into those kettles of turkey vultures um, so then they can ambush the prey below. Amazing. But for me, 
what it's really all about is this resplendent cat saw. <laughs> and this is the I know. <laughs> this is the bird that got me into birding. When Jean Fasani put a spotting scope on a resplendent quetzal in Costa Rica, that was like the light switch for me. Um, and so this is uh, this is related to, to trogons, which is a family that so this is a trogon here, um, which is a family that we don't really have in this part of North America. But it's a large trogon that eats avocados. So uh, not like the kind that we get at the store, but uh, there's these little small avocados that are produced on these huge rainforest uh, canopy trees. And if you find fruiting avocados in the cloud forest, you're likely to find these uh, quetzals that are specialists on them. But if this wasn't enough for like just gaudy plumage, like just wait until you see one of the uh, mature males. The three foot long tail. It's like, come on. <laughs> and then this like amazing, like big fan crest. Just stunning bird. I mean, this, this bird is, you know, it's, it's in decline. It's pretty rare. They're common in the right environment. And so you can go to places and have a really good shot at seeing these, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, these are revered in a lot of, you know, indigenous um, cultures and communities. Quetzals are, are sacred, sacred birds. How could, the, how could this bird not be secret? Mm -hmm. All birds are fantastic. Some yeah. also have three foot long tails. <laughs> <laughs> so not all about the birds. It's a howler monkey mom with a baby climbing on top of the head. Howler monkeys with baby climbing off into a certain doom. Could you imagine, like, your kid just walks out on a branch 50 feet over nothing? <laughs> uh, but no, this is growing up as a howler monkey. Um, Wandering around in the trees by yourself. Howler monkey eating the fruits out of the top of this tree. Squirrel monkeys. Um, it's a kawati, C O A T I, kawati, which is related to uh, raccoons and um, kind of behave a lot like, like, yes. like raccoons as well. Uh, around, going around the understory, eating whatever they come across. They often come up to you know, dumpsters and things like that as well. This is, I think, a northern tamandua, which is a um, kind of anteater you came across. Now, the landscapes were stunning and really interesting photographically. Um, just these amazing patterns and shapes to be able to work with um, as a photographer. And, you know, you just fall in love with taking amazing pictures of these leading lines and these, these agricultural landscapes. Just, just so cool. Wow. And then it's like only on second glance, you're like, wait a minute. No, this is like... This is like slash and burn agriculture, where like they're you know cutting down these patches of rainforest, and with each year that goes by, you know these this agriculture creeps a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit farther up the hillside. Fortunately, um, the soil is really good in Panama, and so when you clear an area for agriculture, that soil is going to last you a long time. Unlike other places, like in the Amazon basin, where tropical rainforest soil is actually really poor. And so you have to slash, burn everything, just so you can have enough nutrient to grow one set of crops and then move on. So agriculture here is, you know, once you have something in crop, you're good. But as populations expand, as agricultural <coughs> needs expand, nevertheless it does expand um, geographically too. And our guide was saying that, uh, you know, the quetzal, well, not so much quetzal as they eat fruit, but a lot of the insect insectivorous birds are in decline in these areas because there's a lot of pesticides used in the agriculture. And that kills the bugs, and the uh, bugs, and it kills the birds, they eat the bugs. Um, but one thing I loved is that there's signs like this all throughout <laughs> the rainforest. And the bus came, no, I Wi Fi, and I was like, okay, I eat, wait, I'm going to try to make it the next one. In the forest, there's no Wi Fi, but surely there you'll find a better connection. <laughs> so before we go to our next destination, which will be the desert southwest, I wanted to um, just have a quick little interlude um, because I know some of you are probably thinking what I'm thinking all the time, which is, is what is like there's an inherent conflict between ecotourism and carbon footprint, right? Doing this sort of travel burns a lot of carbon. And how do we square that? And I do not have an answer for you tonight, um, nor is there a good answer to this, but I think it's worth at least posing a few different questions here. So one is like ecotourism does have a significant carbon footprint, but how big is it really? Can we at least put it in context of other types of carbon expenditures? 
So this is the only graphy thing I'll show you, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a pie chart of all the ways in which we burn carbon in the world. We have power, generation, industry, residence, heating. This blue is transportation. So of the 22% of our global carbon emissions that are related to transportation, we have most of that in shipping and personal vehicles and international shipping. 11% of that is on flights. So we have 11% of 22% is kind of the impact of airline travel um, on global carbon emissions. And of that, maybe half of that is, uh, is tourism and the other half is business and, and other things like that. So we're talking about basically 1% of global carbon emissions related to tourism. If you want to subdivide it from there, you can, talking about you know, carbon offsets, we're talking about the difference between tourism and ecotourism, because um, there's other types of carbon uh, footprint besides the flight. There's all the things that, are, that happen in country, traveling around the country, the, um, the production costs, staying in the lodges you stand, etc. Um, but I want to at least just kind of put that in context of how much ecotourism um, burns, at least tourism burns in terms of carbon compared to some of the other sectors that are going on. Is it a lot? Yeah. Um, but I think it's, there's, there's different versions of what a lot means depending on, um, on what you're talking about. So my question is like, you know, are there kind of necessary evils in terms of what's okay, what it's okay to spend carbon on or things that are better or worse? This is maybe not in a very appropriate analogy, but one I'm thinking I was thinking about is like, okay, like we're never going to ask hospitals to, to stop doing procedures because of their carbon footprint. Um, you know, if there's procedures that have a high carbon cost, we're, we're going to accept as a society that we want to be able to treat as many patients as possible, keep people healthy. Um, so like hospitals, you know, they're, you know, as carbon, as you know, the, the, the carbon picture and, and technology improves, so will the carbon expense of hospitals. But like that's kind of one example where like, okay, like we're not going to really worry about carbon you know, emissions at like a hospital. And this is why it's not like it's not a very appropriate analogy to ecotourism. That's a very different thing. But I do feel in my bones that it's really important that this sort of travel be possible. Um, you know, it changed my life and it changes other people's lives. And when I think about what I want the future to look like, I want a future where people are really excited to travel across the world to see the most amazing animals and places that the planet has, to go on pilgrimages to these places because we care about them so much and they're so spectacular and they're so amazing. <clears throat> there's plenty of amazing places you know, right in your backyard, but then there's also like elephants and quetzals and things like that. <clears throat> and you know, of course not everybody can go see those things, and in fact the vast majority of humanity <clears throat> and people even you know, right here in Vermont will never have the opportunity to do that. Um, but but I don't think that means that those that do have the affluence and privilege to be able to, you know, shouldn't be able to. I, I think it's really important that we be able to do this. Um, because with these trips comes a really important responsibility, I think. Um, you know, if you're just going out there to, in, to be indulgent, I don't think that's enough. We make a point in all of our trips that, you know, with this comes the expectation that you're going to learn as much as you can dig into this experience and come back and make different decisions in your life, how you spend your money, how you interact with the natural world, um, how you uh, share what you've learned with others. And you know that's hard to measure, but I think it's, it exists and it's really important. Um, and you know the 1% the of people that have the ability to do these sorts of trips are also the 1% of people who probably have the most ability to make changes economically um, to impact systems and businesses and the way things are done and you know economics and all that. And so I think it's important that those that have the affluence go and see how their decisions are impacting um, you know wildlife around the world. Um, so that's all, that's my pontificating for the night. And again, I don't have any answers here, but it's worth acknowledging before we move on because this is an important thing to always be to be considering. So let's go here to Capitol Reef National Park. Um, this is just outside the back window of our, of our lodge here, looking at some beautiful uh, sandstone formations. And where we are, the beauty of the landscape out there uh, kind of one foundational rule of geology is that the farther down you go, the older the rock gets, right? Um, 
And, you know, the, this is a cross-section of that whole Colorado plateau from, like, you know, Arizona, Utah, to New Mexico. And all those layers are laid out like pages of a book. And different rivers and other formations cut down through that. So when you're in Bryce Canyon, you're cutting into the top layers of the story. When you're in Zion Canyon, you're cutting into the Jurassic period. Um, when, you're cut, when you're down here in the Vermilion Cliffs, you're cutting down into the Triassic, where you know, Triceratops are moving around and whatnot. Yeah. When you're in the Grand Canyon, you're looking deep down into rock that's 1.5 billion years old, some of the oldest rock um, that is on display in North America. This, in some places, looking across the, the rocky expanses of Grand Staircase Escalante, mm -hmm. down in the bottom of the Navajo sandstone cliffs in uh, Capitol Reef National Park. Capitol Reef is amazing because it's the same exact rock strata as Zion National Park, but with no people there. Um, <laughs> and what? And pie. And pie. Pie? Yeah, they have that the fruit, fruit, fruit. Oh, fruit. Yeah. Fruit. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, <laughs> on the next trip to the Southwest, <laughs> we will be going, <laughs> going there. Um, so here, instead of pointing at things, we take pictures of things with our cell phones. So here we have Randy taking pictures of the hoodoos in Bryce Canyon, these amazing limestone and dolostone formations. Limestone and dolostone is all over the Champlain Valley. Right? Um, it's rocks that we're familiar with here as Vermonters, but it does different things here when exposed to different types of water. And we take selfies with cool things in the background. Here's at the top of Zion Canyon, uh, or sorry, uh, Bryce Canyon, looking at the hoodoos in the distance. Sometimes we walk down into the hoodoos. This is our group descending down into the hoodoos on this trail. The light reflecting off of this unto itself is just amazing, isn't it? One other little photo photo tip here is uh, I often walk around with my telephoto lens on because I'm photographing wildlife and I don't have the patience to carry both lenses and change it all the time for landscapes. So I look for landscapes that can be accomplished with a telephoto lens. So in this case, this photo was basically taken from here, looking out at a tiny little spot right there, zooming in, and it looks like that. Now, the cool thing about telephoto landscape images is that you can compress huge expanses of space into one plane. So like this uh, ridge back here is maybe a mile or two farther away than this. But you can collapse it all together in these telephoto landscapes and everything according to your camera is just out there at that infinity plane. Brace Canyon as the sun's going down. Then from here we went to the Grand Canyon, looking down into the oldest rock, looking across 20 miles of, uh, of space. This is at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And for folks like my dad, um, this was the best part of the trip because you could just um, walk out the back door of your, uh, your cabin and get a breakfast burrito and a coffee and just sit in an Adirondack chair and this is the view. <clears throat> so we didn't need to go anywhere to have our day here. Um, so this is looking down into the uh, great temple formations. <clears throat> What time of year? This was September. Yeah. Yep. And this is unusually cloudy um, for, for down there for September. A little smoky, too. Um, and each different color of rock is a different type of rock, a different age of rock. And the, uh, the harder, stronger rocks, um, they resist weathering more than the weaker rocks. And so, like, the weaker limestones kind of have these fan shapes to them, while the harder sandstones are more straight up and down. Sunset at uh, Cape Royal. Then we also got to see things like California condors. Um, there's a pop there's only like 500 of these left on the planet. I say left, but their populations are increasing thanks to a lot of really great um, conservation work. And about half of the ones in the in the world live in California, and the other half live in this Colorado Plateau area. And so you can look up, and each adult has a wing tag, so you can keep track of it, and you can look it up. And so this condor was born. The same year that I was in Costa Rica with Chip, um, and born at the World Center for Birds of Prey in Idaho, uh, as part of the, re the conservation uh, re reintroduction efforts. And here it is now at the Navajo Bridges near uh, Grand Canyon. They went down to Zion National Park, dropping 5,000 feet in elevation, which means it's much warmer, much greener, much more botanical diversity as well. And this tiny little creek here, that's smaller than the North Branch, is responsible for carving out. All of Zion Canyon, this entire mm -hmm. landscape, 3,000 foot deep cliffs carved by just this mighty little uh, Virgin River here. Last 
thing I experienced in the desert was a uh, tiger salamander. And in fact, we found this uh, under an ice machine at the motel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other side of a uh, asphalt parking lot. So I don't know where it came from, but it knew where the water was, that's for sure. And it was, it was uh, kind of stuck under the ice machine in the, in the puddle uh, left by the outflow of the ice machine. Some of the botany, for those botanists, is familiar out there. This is a type of Parnassus, grass of Parnassus, which we have here in Vermont. Anybody who reads Brian Pfeiffer's uh, essays, he recently had one about grass of Parnassus. And they happened to be blooming at the same time, so I was out in the field with Brian looking at this flower, then went down to the desert and found its neighbor. Um, so this is uh, Parnassus palustris, a different species, but looks basically the same. Um, is that amazing here? Oh yeah, and these are maidenhair ferns. Thanks. These are maidenhair ferns, uh, different species of maidenhair fern, but maidenhair nonetheless. Um, that uh, so the Adiantum genus um, that are growing in the wet little seeps in the rocks. Now we're going to go to a different place. We're going to go to South Africa, where the wildlife gets right up in your face. Um, and this is a hornbill. Remember um, Zazu from The Lion King? It's a hornbill. <laughs> A uh, different kind of hornbill, but nevertheless. <laughs> so um, South Africa was was pretty sensational in, in every way. Um, the first impression I had was that it's really big. I didn't appreciate how big it was. This is South Africa. That's Vermont next to South Africa. <laughs> um, here. So you know, it is a, a ten-hour, twelve-hour drive to get from the capital Johannesburg down to Cape Town. Actually, probably more than that. Maybe sixteen-hour drive. So it's it's a big place, big country. And the first half of the trip, we were in Kruger National Park up here. And the second half of the trip, we were down in Cape Town down here. We took a little internal flight to get down there. So here's Kruger National Park up in the Northeast. And it's a big place. That was another thing that I was really um, drawn to, uh, really struck me, is that these are there are some huge conservation areas that gave me a lot of hope for uh, African wildlife conservation that I think we don't get enough of um, hearing kind of secondhand about wildlife conservation efforts in um, different places um, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. I left South Africa being really, um, uh, really hopeful about um, conservation efforts, about the great biologists being done there, about the state of things. You know, are there issues? For sure. Um, but uh, but I left being like, wow, they're, they're, they're doing some things right that I wish we were incorporating into what we do in like Yellowstone, that sort of thing. There's Vermont next to Kruger National Park. Kruger is... Um, Five million acres, and you add in some of the border parks on, on Mozambique, you're talking about an area bigger than Vermont. So, tip to tail on Kruger National Park is 200 miles. Vermont is 150 miles from one end to the other. And this is one of the many gates into Kruger National Park. So, like kind of like Yellowstone or some of our bigger U.S. national parks, there's a road network. Um, there's lodges internally within the park, um, visitor centers, that sort of thing, and there's gates. And the gates are very carefully monitored. They open at precisely at 6 a.m. and they close precisely at 6 p.m. You have to end at the lodges inside the park, there's gates that open at those times as well. So when you come in, you have to tell them where you're going, what lodge you're staying at. And they keep very careful tally on how many cars come in and then at 6 p.m. where those cars ended up. And if there's any discrepancy between the number that came in and the number that went out, that's a huge red flag. Why? Poaching, right. Um, and so that's, that's why they have this, this, this such strict time. Any cars that are out of the gates, not in the, not in the any, any cars that haven't left the park or settled into the lodge by six o'clock are uh, potential poaching threats. So the, the plan for Kruger National Park is you wake up really early in the morning at like five and you uh, start down some coffee and some biscotti and then you hop in your open safari jeep, you wait for the gates to open, and then you head out into the park. Now, I thought that like the Lion King and National Geographic exaggerate the amount of wildlife in, in, um, in these places, but it, it doesn't. Like, this is a pretty regular scene. We're like, here's giraffes, and they're, the photo is being ruined by these zebra and wildebeest that are in the foreground <laughs> of these giraffes. There's actually baboons in this tree, too. Um, and so, you know, everywhere you turn, there's just incredible uh, wildlife diversity. Giraffes feeding at the top of a plant, that zebra feeding at the bottom. We have an impossible crossing the road while a troop of baboons is hanging out on a bridge <laughs> out of yards away. Just amazing diversity. 
the vast herds of these Cape um, buffalo, a thousand Cape buffalo at a time, moving across the landscape in these huge herds, um, going to the watering holes. One, other, one great example of um, conservation man for, for, um, uh, uh, foresight, conservation foresight. Kruger National Park is a pretty old park. Uh, it was established under a different name in 1898. Um, so we're talking like same era as like Yosemite, Yellowstone, and some of our big US national parks in terms of um, thinking about conservation. And this was established because the wildlife populations in South Africa had been hunted down to really scary low levels. And so this was a game reserve to replenish populations first. And one of the things that they did early on in the 1920s and 30s was recognize that there's rivers throughout this park, but many of these rivers originate outside the park. And if there were changes in development or political whims, those rivers could be diverted away for agriculture, for development, for damming and reservoirs, whatever, and Kruger could lose its lifeblood of water moving through it. And so they built these reservoirs um, and impoundments, and in many cases created water holes using windmills um, to create water sources all throughout the park so that if the rivers dried up or diverted, the wildlife wouldn't all just you know, die of thirst, which is happening in places like uh, Kenya, if you've been following that. They've had so little rain that uh, there, there is no more water for a lot of these critters to drink. Um, anyway, also check out, there's a lot of between these places, too. I'll just go back a couple of pictures here and compare this. And there is there, which is 50 and 100 a year approach for, for the IP. Um, is actually increasing and increasing, which presents an interesting conundrum in terms of. Uh, wildlife conservation. A similar problem that we're having in Yellowstone with bison. You have bison. The icon of the West. It is part of our everybody that lives you know, across this country. Um, and yet, there's too many of them in Yellowstone. Their populations have increased to the point where they're, um, they're overgrazing the park. So when they leave the park, the Park Service doesn't want them back in. But nobody wants them outside of the park either because they interfere with ranching operations. And so they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Nobody wants them. And so uh, what do you do? Do you hunt them? Do you round them up and cull them? Do you try to use them to, to inoculate other populations uh, in, in new parks throughout the country? <laughs> Sell them to Ted Turner. <laughs> Sell them to Ted Turner is a solution that has, has happened in some cases, yeah. Um, so, but you know, it's, it's for the interest of preserving the ecology of Yellowstone Park for everything. Same thing is happening with elephants in Kruger. You have 16,000 elephants in a place that can maybe support seven or 8,000. No one wants to call elephants, right? They tried that, that didn't go over so well, right? Um, they're so intelligent, they're so smart, they're so beloved, like everybody has opinions, regardless of who you are on the planet, you know about elephants and you care about them a lot, right? You can't round up and slaughter a whole bunch of elephants and get away with it. Um, but then what does that do ecologically? Um, so there's not a good answer to that either. I think they're scratching their heads thinking, what do we do about these 16,000 elephants in the park? Um, because they, if they stay here, they rip trees out of the ground as a normal part of their foraging. So pretty soon you're just run out of trees. And we go through places that had experienced a lot of bison, um, <laughs> elephant grazing. Um, and it's just, you know, a whole, you know, it's a thousand acres of knocked down trees, right? And at the right scale, this, the park can sustain that just fine. But, um, but yeah, anyway, it's interesting. So there's a lot of elephants, but there's way more impala. There's like 160,000 impala throughout the park, and this is like the cheeseburger of the of, of the park. Like that. Lockstacker. Let's see if you can find it. Oh, <laughs> and then it turned around and showed us the, the whole bird here. So these oxpeckers are, um, uh, yeah, they, they basically preen the, there's two kinds of oxpeckers, a red-billed one and a yellow-billed one. Um, and one preens the fur um, for, um, for insects, and the other kind of just like bites stuff out of it, so they kind of forage in different ways. Niche partitioning on the back of the same giraffe, right? Uh -huh. 
Um, elf, uh, no, not elephants. What are these called again, Martin? Hippos. Hippos, that's right. <laughs> Hippopotamus with ox peckers on top of them. Right? Um, Hippopotamus are known as the most dangerous animal on the planet, perhaps, certainly in Africa. Um, not because they eat people, but because they are very aggressive uh, if you encounter one on foot. We had the opportunity of seeing a newborn baby giraffe as well. Um, which is just just incredible, watching this little giraffe try to walk on those legs that are six feet tall already. Mom stands like 15 or 16 feet tall, and uh, and this baby, just a you know a few days old, is already you know the size of a small bison. Though the bison, uh, keep doing that. Although the elephant populations are um, are healthy. The population dynamics within that have changed in that you don't find a lot of big tuskers anymore, they call it. Tusks of elephant grow throughout their lives, and so when you get to be 30, 40, 50, 60 years old as an elephant, your tusks can be you know, 8, 10 feet long, uh, dragging on the ground practically. And so this is one of the bigger tusk elephants that we saw the whole trip there. Um, but this is not, doesn't hold a candle to some of the, the big tuskers, of which there's only a few left. And in fact, one thing they've seen is, um, as time has gone by, I've seen the, uh, some elephants actually being born with no tusks at all. Now, if you were born with no tusks, you know, originally, you know, long ago, that was not really adaptive evolutionarily. But if you have no tusks, you're not going to get pushed. And so the elephants that don't have tusks, are, there's actually a small population of them. You see them from time to time throughout the park of tuskless elephants. Um, so it's an example of artificial selection uh, as a result of um, human stuff. This is one of the coolest moments. There's two groups of elephants. This is a watering hole. We were up uh, at this overlook, looking down at this watering hole. And a mile off that way was this little troop of elephants. And a mile off this way was a different troop of elephants, coming from totally different sides of the park. And they were approaching, both approaching this watering hole. And as they came together, this little one ran out in front of, the, um, of, of its family and stuck his trunk out like this. And then the incoming troop, they held out their trunk and they kind of like shook trunks with the little one as like a welcoming of these two groups coming together. Here we are at a, a little bird line watching birds and then a group of elephants came over and started drinking and didn't they line up just... <laughs> Except there's a, a crocodile photo on the corner. And actually, there's a herd of hippos also <laughs> in the other corner. Oh, and more elephants back there. Um, so we were actually looking at some other things, like this African jacana, which is a, a water bird. Check out the toes on this thing. So we have jacanas here, different species here in North America. If you go down to like Florida and farther south, you'll find them. Um, and long toes, they can actually walk on top of floating vegetation. Now, if you were a water bird in uh, South Africa, you have other things to watch out for. And I couldn't believe how close some of these birds got to these sleeping crocodiles. So then, so we were, this was um, a trip looking for all sorts of things. And uh, so, you know, the big creatures were, were part of it. But often we found ourselves using the big creatures to describe locations relative to the birds we were trying to find. So we said, okay. We're looking for that lilac breasted roller to go left of the bison until you get to the giraffe and then go behind the giraffe and the zebra and so between the zebra and the wildebeest. So bird watching here is much different than bird watching back in Panama. Right? Um, oh my gosh, it's awesome. This is the southern tip of the continent, right? There's not a lot of things migrating through because there's nowhere to go. And so we saw 315 species of birds in our, in our uh, 11 days in South Africa. Almost all of them were residents. They lived there all the time, um, which is great because you could see them you know, any time of year. And you didn't have to look through tropical rainforests to find them. They were just sitting out on open branches. Um, so you can see there's why I like crested roller, and everybody just look and then see the bird. They're all out in the open. It's great. Stunning birds. I like crested roller. But all the critters there were, were, were spectacular. It's yellow-billed stork foraging next to a crocodile. Lesser striped swallow. This is a bachelor eagle who, uh, rumor has it, their face changes color depending on their mood. You can go from red to yellow. 
This is a uh, pearl spotted owlet, which looks a lot like our uh, northern pygmy owls. Long tail, wide up. There's a test on this later. Um, uh, what's this? A harrier, uh, African harrier hawk. And then a green wood hoopoo. It was so difficult to try to study for birds for this because you open the bird book and you're like, I have never seen anything that looks like this. I don't even know what family this belongs to. Um, so it's very hard to have something to hang your hat on in terms of like bird diversity. Like I don't even, like, you know, if I see a flycatcher, I might not know what it is, but like, okay, that's a flycatcher. But like, if I see this, I'm like, I, have no, I don't know. <laughs> and all sorts of stuff like that. So southern mast uh, weaver building this beautiful um, nest here. Helmeted guinea fowl were everywhere. Uh, black, black bill, black winged, black bat, black winged kite, black something kite. Um, tawny eagle. This thing is called uh, a. This one's I wanted to remember. It's called a crowned lapwing. Another example of a bird named after the thing that's not the obvious thing you should name it after. <laughs> um, a uh, long-tailed widow bird, lyre-tailed widow bird, and then a Cape robin shaft. This is like their, you know, like their robin. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a robin, but uh, but it's kind of was around and never present like that. So we'll finish up with a couple of fun sightings. Now, in Kruger, everybody's very impatient when it comes to watching wildlife. They'll show up at a sighting, and if nothing happens, everybody leaves. Now, in Yellowstone, my training was, you just stay there all day if you need to until the thing does something. Um, so this is a cheetah that was spotted 100 yards away, sleeping under this tree. And you know, most of the time it had its head down every once in a while, put its head up. And people got sick of watching this, so everybody left. But I really wanted to stay because I knew eventually something would happen. This cheetah was sleeping in the shade, and the sun was moving, and this cheetah was about to lose its shade. As soon as that happened, this cheetah would have to get up, so it wouldn't want to, and something would happen then. And so everybody else left. Our group was like, "Let's go!" And I'm like, "Just give it." Ten more minutes. Close. Something's going to happen in ten minutes. So he gave it ten minutes, and then Cheetah stretched, got up, did one of those, and then we were the only interesting thing around at that point. <laughs> now, amazingly, the, the the creatures out here they don't treat a safari vehicle as human. They, they're just another um, herd animal moving around. <laughs> If you get out of the vehicle, you're dead. Um, so you're not actually allowed out of the vehicle. And unlike Yellowstone, people actually follow the rules about that. <laughs> um, but you're just, you know, you're just like another elephant or something like that if you're in a safari jeep. But we're the only one around, so this cheetah came right to us with the perfect lighting, blowing out of the eyes. And then I had the best I told you so moment after. <laughs> <laughs> half the group had already left. So half the group didn't see this. Um, but fortunately, the next day, the other group had an encounter with the cheetah that the first half didn't. Um, so it all worked out karmically in the end. Um, but uh, cheetahs are pretty rare. There's only 125 of them or so in all of uh, uh, Kruger's from the last estimate that I saw. So pretty lucky settings. More common are these lions. Um, this next photograph is a little gruesome, so if you don't like that, you can turn away. But uh, you know, in Yellowstone, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you when I turn the turn the slide. Um, <laughs> but you know, in Yellowstone, I'm used to there being carcasses of things, but like five miles away that you look at through a spotting scope. Here, there was a giraffe carcass that lions had taken down the night before. It was in the road. We had to drive around the the, the um, giraffe carcass to just get by. And so sleeping around the giraffe carcass was this entire pride of lions that were just zonked out. So here's the next picture. <clears throat> so its legs are just out there in the road. Um, and this, this is what a carcass looks like one day after um, you know, lions have, uh, have found it. Um, so the lions were very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, a lot of this um, and a lot of that. <laughs> Great. So the sun comes down, it approaches six o'clock, we have to get back in Kruger, and then we had one more.
Bay, there's uh, southern right whales that are swimming around out here making these ripples. Um, and this reminded me so much of like Big Sur in California, very Mediterranean climate, really steep mountains going right down to the water. Um, you come through this mountain pass, get to the bottom, and there would be like a yoga studio next to a cafe that sold avocado toast. No joke. Like, where am I? Is this like San Francisco? <laughs> and, uh, and Cape Town itself has three and a half million people, and it's, uh, has, it's probably the wealthiest city in probably in, in, in Africa. There's a lot of affluence there. There's a lot of poverty as well. So a huge um, economic disparity. But there's a lot of uh, economic um, center in, in Cape Town, so really well developed, you know, a lot of nice homes and things like that, good infrastructure. And so we went to Cape of Good Hope, the farthest, the most southwestern point in the continent. We pointed at things here too. Uh, things like the seals that were down on the beach, things like lighthouses. Uh, it felt very familiar. But there was really unusual birds here too. It's the Cape Sugarbird. Um, that has this amazing tail that moves like a ribbon dancer when the bird flies around. Yeah. Also, we had flamingos all yeah. over the place. Um, lesser flamingos and greater, greater flamingos, which you can tell apart if you remember, which I don't. Um, but made it for just great, great landscapes, great scenery. Yeah. There's the bird that you forget is a bird. Oh. It's the ostrich. So here we are at Cape of Good Hope. Um, you know, enjoying seals and sea lions and seabirds, and turn around and there's like ostrich just walking the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and also, so I'll leave you with um, with the last the last cute cute sighting here. These are Cape uh, penguin, um, which there's a colony of. Mostly they nest on islands, but there's one colony that nested on on land. Um, and uh, and there was. Boardwalk that was built uh, to access some beaches, and they nest on the other side of this boardwalk. And so um, here, the wildlife has the right. Of So that's the end of our, our tour tonight. Um, I, I, uh, thanks very much. The last thing I would be remiss to mention that we go to these places a lot, so uh, you should join us for some of them. So um, let me do a quick preview for what's coming up this year and what we're doing next year. For anybody that's interested, just shoot me an email, I'll tell you more. Um, but still space for this year is uh, along the Massachusetts coast in March. Um, Cape May, birding, one of the best uh, spring migratory bird watching destinations in the country is Cape May, New Jersey of all places. Um, but spectacular birding will be going there with Chip in, um, in May. Texas in April, uh, the other best place in the, in the lower 48 for uh, migration birding. And then putting together a, a trip to Peru for birding in September. Then next year, um, we're looking at uh, a couple of interesting trips. We're putting together a trip way up north into Canada uh, to be with the Cree people. Um, and Naomi's going to be leading um, that program. So if you're interested in a, in a journey unlike anything else I just talked about, um, actually being with, with the Cree, um, setting beaver traps, trying you know, your hand at setting up ice fishing nets, and you know, basically learning, learning what Cree culture is like, we're going to James Bay. Um, there's a full solar eclipse that's happening uh, next year. Totality is going to be right over Hill Country in Texas, which is one of the best birding places in April in the country. So we're going to be doing a trip that combines the solar eclipse and birding. We're going to South Africa again. Um, we're putting together a bird and mammal trip to the Pantanal down in uh, Argentina, which is one of those places, this largest wetland complex in the world. Have you ever seen pictures of uh, jaguars hunting capybaras? That's where you go to see that. And we're also working on putting together a burning trip to Japan. So some of these are more speculative than others, um, but keep an eye on our, on our website, our Adventures of Fire page on our website for other destinations as they become available. And feel free to reach out to me by email if you want to see if uh, this could be something you'd like to do. So now that's really it. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Wow.